Well, good morning and welcome to Willisburg Christian's online worship service. We're glad you're here. Make sure you have your Bibles with you as we turn and look in Isaiah today. Also, make sure you have something that represents the elements of the Lord's Supper. And lastly, make sure your hearts and minds are ready to engage as we worship God together. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. 
come to the Lord's table, there's many one-word descriptions we could use uh, for this moment. Uh, Sacrifice, love, death, life, salvation. Today, though, I'd like for us to use the word remember. Human memory is a very fragile thing. Without checking, can you recall what this second song was from four services ago? Or how about the, the scripture from five sermons ago? I admit I can't. There are some things we remember that we wish we could forget, and there's things we forget we wish we could remember. Well, the Apostle Paul passed on from memory something he received and something he considered to be of first importance to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, he wrote, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So this morning I encourage you to remember. Remember the, the words of Jesus when he said, This is my body, which is for you. Remember the debt you owed, the price he paid, and that how it was for love that he set you free. Remember. Again, we're glad you're with us. You know, sometimes having a deep conviction about something is difficult when it's unpopular. Doing the right thing, saying the right thing. And I'm not talking about having an unpopular opinion about something or, or taking a stand on some political view that you may have that seems unpopular. I'm not even talking about being a Bengals fan or a Reds fan in a church where it's unpopular to do so because everybody's a Green Bay Packer or a Yankees fan, which makes no sense since we're in the middle of Kentucky, right? And besides, I think somewhere in the Bible, God says it's a sin to be a Packers and a Yankees fan, but that's for another sermon. What I'm talking about is, is having a conviction, a firmly held belief in the absolute truths of God's word and his character in a world that doesn't seek to honor God in any way. In fact, the word conviction does mean to have a firmly held belief. And if we consider ourselves Christians, then we have a conviction, a firmly held belief that God has created the world and designed life. And so because He's created the world and designed life, we live according to His desires and His character. 
So when followers of the one true God of the Bible stand firmly on what he says, then we stand in an uncommon conviction compared to the world's standards. For example, as a follower of God, I have the uncommon conviction of being content. Being content with what I do have and content with what I don't have. While the world says you should never be content. You should always strive for bigger and better. Reach for the golden ring. As a follower of God, I should have the uncommon conviction of loving my enemies. While the world tells us, you don't love your enemies. If you disagree with somebody, you make sure you point all your anger towards them. You demean them. As I try to look and live like Jesus in this world, I should have the uncommon conviction to help and be patient with those who may have a weak moment of faith or or stumble in some point. I should hold them accountable in love. But the world tells us if somebody makes a mistake, you point it out, you embarrass them, and then you judge them. Now, having godly conviction sounds nice, but to be honest, it's not easy. That's why it's so uncommon. And so we're going to look at Isaiah because he's a perfect example of uncommon conviction. God is going to ask him to speak a message to the Jewish nation. And he's going to ask him to say, you've sinned, you've strayed as a nation from your firmly held belief, your conviction in God. And because of that, you're suffering consequences. At this time in history, um, the Jewish nation was making alliances with evil countries. They were taking pagan worship practices and mingling it with their faith in the one true God. They were being led to worship idols and false gods. They were being led astray to live lives outside the standards of God's expectations. As a matter of fact, they were fighting each other. And so uh, in this political struggle and spiritual decline, God calls on Isaiah to tell the people, specifically of Judah, the southern kingdom, that they needed to return to God. Now the problem is they didn't want to hear that. Listen to what God says as he starts off the conversation in chapter 1 in verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Drop down to verses 15 and 17. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Well, who wants to hear that, right? God is informing Isaiah and the Jewish nation why they are failing, why they are facing opposition from those who want to take them captive. No one wants to hear how they have contributed to their own downfall. No one likes to take responsibility for their actions. And the Jews during the time of Isaiah didn't want to hear this message from God. And it would have been easy for Isaiah to ignore God and remain silent, but silence doesn't create a remedy for people. Having uncommon conviction to follow God does. So Isaiah gets this visit from God. Take a look in chapter 6. If you'll turn there, God begins to reveal himself to Isaiah, and this is what happens. Isaiah writes about it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings he covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Man, that is unmistakably God, right? When the thresholds are shaking and the whole temple is filled with smoke, you're either at an ACDC concert 
or God has entered the room. And in this case, it was God who had arrived in the presence of Isaiah. Now, God has Isaiah's full attention. So listen to Isaiah's response there in verse 5. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, all that sounds a little odd, but what God is doing is cleansing. He's purifying Isaiah and removing his guilt so that when he has a message to speak, he can do so with integrity. And that's the first action of those who have an uncommon conviction to follow God. They have to say, woe to me. I'm unclean. I'm guilty. I'm wrong. You see, when Isaiah was face to face with God, (laughs) he recognized who he was in comparison to a perfect God. He was a sinner. And so he said, I surrender to you, God, first and remove my guilt so that I can have uncommon conviction, so people will listen to my message. God, in verse 7, takes away his guilt. Our first firmly held belief should be this. We are wrong. We are sinners. And we confess our brokenness. And we must surrender to a God who can and is willing to save us, to purify us, to remove our guilt. And when we make that uncommon confession, then that leads us to uncommon conviction. And we can begin to speak a message of God with integrity. Now, that doesn't mean that that we judge the world. It doesn't mean that we're better than everybody else. It merely means that we've surrendered to God and we're we're calling on Him to use us. Take a look at verse 8. Look what happens in Isaiah's life. He says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. When we have the knowledge that God is the only one who can remove our guilt and save us from our sin, we should have this uncommon conviction to go tell others who God is and what He desires. Isaiah could not remain quiet. He he realized that God had cleansed him, so now he says, Send me. I want to go tell people that God is still in control, that God is still holy, that He still speaks, and I want to tell them that He can remedy their problem of sin. And He wants to go to the Jewish people and tell them, confess your sins to God, and then you can live in this wonderful relationship with Him and have uncommon conviction. But even when you have a message of grace and forgiveness that you're excited about, I mean, Isaiah is brimming with with courage and he's oozing with excitement. But God wants to tell him, not everyone's going to accept it. Take a look at verse 9, what God says to Isaiah. Go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, close their eyes. Otherwise, they might not see with their eyes or hear with their ears understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie in ruin and without inhabitant, until houses are left deserted and fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. What we see here is God giving Isaiah a job description. And to be perfectly honest, It doesn't sound like a great job. I can just imagine, here's Isaiah, excited. I've seen God. He's removed my guilt. I am so excited. I want to go tell everyone about what God can do. Here I am. Send me. But then God says, I want to warn you of something. They will not like what you say. They will not listen to your message Their eyes will not see the change in your life, and so they will never perceive they need to change their life, and their hearts will not be softened because of your uncommon conviction. And Isaiah responds, okay, well then, how long do I have to do this? If they're not going to listen, 
How long do I have to be uncommonly convicted to hold this belief? (laughs) And God says, until the entire nation of Judah is destroyed, every house is demolished, people are scattered, cities are rendered useless, until they feel like I've utterly forsaken them. They won't believe your message until they raise the white flag to their enemies that will overtake them because of their disobedience and their desire to govern their own lives rather than follow me. Now, this is going to require some uncommon conviction on Isaiah's part to speak God's truth, to humble himself and honor God before a whole nation of people who don't believe in humility and are living outside of God's will. Instead, as Isaiah speaks, he's going to be speaking to a nation that is prideful and only lives to honor themselves. This uncommon conviction to follow God is going to cause Isaiah a lot of discomfort and a lot of difficulty. He probably won't have too many friends. Nobody wants to hear this message over and over. He he will have no power. He's going to have to stop following his dreams and start following the leading of God. Isaiah has been asked to be the mouthpiece of God and then told, even after your sacrifice, even after your commitment to follow me, people aren't going to listen. They aren't going to change. And they're probably going to try to make your life miserable because of your uncommon conviction. Trust me, I know, I'm God. (laughs) And Isaiah doesn't run away. Instead, he holds fast to this uncommon conviction for the next almost 60 years. Being a person of uncommon conviction sounds noble and good, but I'm here to tell you it's difficult. And I'm going to be honest, I struggle with it. I struggle with being that person. There are times when I don't want to speak an unpopular message or live in an unpopular way. There are some who are much closer to that amazing, uncommon conviction than I am. Adrian Rogers once said, Faith is not believing God in spite of the evidence. Faith is believing God in spite of the consequences. And having uncommon conviction causes us to follow God in spite of the consequences. I have a friend who was in desperate need of a job back in the recession of 2008 and nine. He had lost his job. He was actively looking for a job. And he was hired as a manager uh, of a Walmart in another community. It was going to be a little bit of a drive, but he was going to have a good steady income and retirement and health insurance. And it was a company that wasn't going anywhere. The only problem was he was going to have to do something that he didn't feel comfortable doing. From time to time, they told him as the manager, he would have to work in the wine and spirits department of Walmart. And he would have to sell alcohol when his cashiers needed a break. And he was instantly conflicted by this. Well, he came to me and he asked, what should I do? And I expressed to him, scripture doesn't say that drinking is a sin, but getting drunk is. But I said, I I completely understand your dilemma. He thought about it for a few days and he came back and he had made a decision. He said, look, I don't think I can stand in that liquor department when families with children like yours walk by. I don't think I can stand there and, and have the possibility of me selling alcohol while people from our church family walk by. And maybe you don't know this, Lance, but I had someone in my family die of alcoholism. And I don't think I want to contribute to that problem. So he went to Walmart and went to the people who hired him. And he told them, I just can't take the job. He said that they looked at him like he was speaking a different language. Are you kidding me? In this economy where everyone is looking for a job, we're going to provide you with this really wonderful position and you're going to turn it down? And he said, yes. And when he told them why, he said they were in disbelief. But that's what uncommon conviction looks like when we think more about what God wants for our lives and from our witness than what we want for our lives. You know, the question is, what are you being convicted of today? Because you are being convicted. 
<laughs> not by my sermon, not by guilt, but by God. You're being convicted to do something, to say something, maybe to change something or provide something with your life today. Being people of uncommon conviction will not be easy, I'm here to tell you, but one day it will be completely worth it. In order to be that person, though, you have to surrender to God. You have to follow His will for your life, not ask Him to bless your path and your decisions for your life. And you have to come to Him and say, I'm not perfect, I need forgiveness in order to have integrity and in order to be able to be a person of uncommon conviction. And so we have to be more concerned about honoring God than about keeping our reputation in this world. It all comes down to this. Are you willing to be one of God's uncommon people?